the power to whom Mackinder's view of geopolitics ought to have appealed was Germany. After all, the one power that really stood in a position to uh, carry into effect the threat of the heartland, particularly given the apparent weakness of Russia of 1905, was the power that could, through its domination of Eastern Europe, shape Euro-Asia. And yet before the First World War, Mackinder seems to have had little more, if any, impact in Berlin than it did in <coughs> London. In the very same year in which Mackinder delivered his lecture, 1904, Kurt von Malzheim, director of the German Marine Academy, delivered a lecture on the sea as a field of operations, das Meer as operation belt, at the Institute for Oceanography here in Berlin. This too was a lecture on geopolitics. Mount Sam used Mahan to stress the importance of what Mahan had called the choke points of the world. Uh, what uh, Mahan meant by that was the points where oceans uh, narrowed into straits, the points where seas connect because if the ocean was so important, if the ocean interconnected, <coughs> the point where you could obstruct movement and where you could dominate the sea lines of communication was the point at which one sea passed into another. So the choke points of the world were places like Gibraltar, linking the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, and places like the Dardanelles, linking the Black Sea <coughs> to the Mediterranean, places like Singapore, uh, linking uh, the Indian Ocean to the Pacific, and even places like Hawaii, which even if, if they were in the middle of the, of, of the Pacific, or still are actually, that happens in the middle of the Pacific, um, uh, were in a position to be vital base points as you cross the ocean. <laughs> Malsan, in his lecture, also used the word of Friedrich Ratzel. Ratzel was the founding father of German geopolitics. And indeed, the fact that Ratzel had addressed the issue of geopolitics before Mackinder is a very good explanation as to why no German needed to bother to read Mackinder, because the subject had already been well established here uh, within Germany. Malzahn used Ransom to deny that geographical position could determine the outcome of a naval war. Ransom, um, who was a uh, professor of geography at the University of Leipzig, had published um, his main book, his Politische uh, Geography, in 1897. And in 1900, he had added a chapter on the law of sea power, the sets their same hair shaft. Ratzel saw the state as an organism which required to expand its territory in order to survive. So like Mackinder, Ratzel was influenced by social Darwinism. Like Mackinder too, Ratzel recognized that the world had become a closed political system. And therefore, living space, Leibniz realm, into which a flourishing state could expand, was no longer available. Everything had been allocated, carved up, and given to the powers, and therefore could not be seized by another power. The solution to the problem of living space, therefore, was the sea. Here there was space. The sea was what could enable Germany to grow, just as it enabled other small states in the past to establish empires. States like Greece, Rome, Venice, Portugal, the Netherlands, and of course Britain. Ratzel believed that trade followed the flag, and sea power both protected trade and expanded trading freedom. Two policy conclusions followed for Germany from what Ratzel and Malzahn were saying. The first was that Germany should support the principle of freedom of the seas in order to prevent uh, British domination. This was an argument that would be played out in the debates of 1909 on the Declaration of London. The Declaration of London was an attempt to revisit uh, what had been uh, decided and addressed in the 
Treaty of Paris after the Crimean War in 1856. And the issue was the definition of contraband. Um, if you had a broad definition of contraband, that is to say that contraband would not just uh, be munitions of war directly uh, uh, defined, but would also be uh, a wider range of commodities, such as food, and might even include food going to the civilian population as well as the armed forces. If you had a, a broad definition of contraband, then it would be possible if Britain were a belligerent power to use the full rate, weight of its maritime implements in order to conduct a blockade. If, on the other hand, you had a narrow definition of, of, of contraband, if contraband was only to be defined as munitions of war, but would not include things like foodstuffs, then, of course, uh, that would uh, be of advantage to uh, powers that had uh, a weaker view, because they would be able to continue to trade, particularly through mutual shipping, uh, in a way that they would not otherwise be able to trade. And Britain would not have the right uh, to intercept ships on the high seas, to examine their cargo, and to seize their cargo if they deemed it uh, about to be delivered to a belligerent power. The crucial question for Britain in 1909 was should it reckon on being a belligerent if there were a future war? Because if it were a belligerent, then it would want a broad definition of contraband. Or should it reckon on being a neutral power? Because if it were a neutral power, then it would want a narrow definition of contraband because that would benefit the British shipping industry. Neutral ship owners would be able to carry a much larger range of goods and will be able to cash in on higher freight prices and so on during time of war. Um, so there was then uh, a big debate. And of course, what Germany wished to have see uh, was a narrow definition of contraband because clearly that would enable Germany to continue to import a broad range of goods during time of war uh, and to do so quite legally. The second big issue was, uh, uh, which Malsan particularly addressed, um, as well as the issue of blockade and contraband, was the issue of how Germany should use its naval forces. Uh, and what he said was that Germany, in order to exercise great uh, and disproportionate influence uh, from a small area and from a small fleet, had to concentrate all its naval power in one place. As Ratzel had put it in 1900, war at sea unites the growing, striking power required on land. A small state, which unites a fleet fit for battle on the decisive point, renders the great state vulnerable. This is a concept derived exactly from land warfare, <coughs> and indeed Maltzan liked that argument as it reflected his wish to adapt the teachings of Clausewitz from land warfare to a maritime context. The idea of concentrating mass in order to seek, a uh, uh, seek victory in a decisive battle was exactly what appealed to uh, the military side, if you like, of Maltzan's thinking. The key point, I think, about Malsan's lecture, and indeed about what Ratzel had written in 1900, was that it chimed with the general drift of German foreign policy. After all, Weltpolitik, the policy embraced by Bülow, first as foreign minister in 1897, and then as chancellor from 1900, was that it was more Mahanian than Mackinderite independent of sea power more than land power. What Weltpolitik required was that Germany get overseas markets. <coughs> Germany needed to support uh, its trade, actively support its trade, and of course the argument that it needed a navy to underpin that. Terpitz's naval policy between 1897 and 1911, and the growth in spending on ships uh, while spending on the army stagnated, suggested that nobody in Berlin read the geographical journal in which McKinder's lecture had been published, or if they did, they didn't believe it. Germany, as the second largest industrial power in the world before 1914, had an interest both in free trade 
and in access to global markets. Uh, as Georges Henri Soutou uh, has pointed out in his wonderful comparative treatment of war aims in the First World War, the idea of Middle Europe, of a central and closed European economic bloc, or even of domination of the heartland, uh, only made economic sense after war had broken out, when Germany was cut off from the world, rest of the world's markets by the British blockade. In other words, uh, the Middle Europe, uh, a domination of the heartland, was a default position, not an, an, op not an optimum one, because the strength of, German uh, of Germany in world markets uh, meant that it was of far more value to have access to those markets, and particularly, of course, to countries like the United States, uh, which were far more developed than those areas in Central Asia to which Germany would otherwise be confined. Ratzel died in 1904, uh, the year of the lecture. And if geopolitics found a spokesman in Germany during the First World War, it was not, in fact, a German, but a Swede, Rudolf Kellen. Kellen's publications suggested a view of Lebensraum which led on Friedrich Naumann's ideas about Middle Europe, and even reflected uh, the famous September 1914 Warriors program drawn up by the Chancellor Lech Holweg and made famous by Fritz Fischer uh, in his current of German war in 50 years ago. Kellen on that a dynamic polity like Germany had to expand, and it could do so through creating regional powers. And so for him, as for many others in Germany during the First World War, uh, the pivotal battle of the First World War became that between Germany and Russia. And the issue uh, which preoccupied them was the issue of who would control Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, from that, who would therefore control that regional power. Nobody saw it in the Mackinderite terms of, if you control that, then you control the world. Now, insofar as there was a struggle during the First World War for the control of Central Europe and for, uh, if you like, near the near parts of Asia, Mackinder had echoes in German strategy throughout the war. A number of policy initiatives recognized that Germany had to resolve the heartland problem before it could address the issues of wider world power. Uh, Erich von Falkenhayn, when he became chief of the general staff after the Battle of the Marne, um, wished to achieve a separate peace with Russia. He saw it as logical to resolve the relationships between Germany and Russia and to look ultimately to an alliance between the two monarchies, which would then face westwards uh, against Britain and France. His big rivals, Hindenburg and Ludendorff at Oberost, uh, in 1915 uh, were determined to defeat Russia uh, and, want, and of course what actually happened in the course of 1915 was that their conquest of the Baltic states was then followed up by the overrunning of Poland and ultimately of Serbia in the Balkans. In other words, the main military effort of 1915 as far as the Germans were concerned went towards the east and towards the solving the like a heartland problem. And, of course, the culmination of the whole process in 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which effectively does give Germany uh, control of the heartland, exactly as Mackinder might have uh, suggested. But a maritime strategy exercised by the Rimlands, by those powers in Western Europe and Britain, the power that stood off the West European coast, a maritime strategy exercised by the Rimlands what proved to be an effective counter to German success in the heartland. This maritime strategy was not the Harney in the sense that Maltzham had anticipated, as there was no decisive naval battle. The Battle of Jutland did not, in fact, prove decisive, at least for Germany. As many in German naval circles had realized before 1914, why should Britain submit itself to the chances of battle when its strategic position as an island across Germany's main exits 
uh, out to the Atlantic, gave it maritime control without having to fight back. So Britain's strategy in the First World War was less Mahani than Corbettian. Just to explain what I mean. Julian Corbett, who was not an American but a Briton, uh, wrote a book in 1911 called Some Principles of Maritime Strategy. And in that book, he recognized that the Navy alone could not produce a decision in the war. But that did not mean that a rimland power like Britain could not adopt an effective strategy. He suggested, first of all, that a power like Britain could use its amphibious capabilities to intervene on the continent of Europe, choosing a point calculated to maximize strategic effect. He argued that a maritime power like Britain could opt for limited interference in what would be an unlimited war. And you could argue, looking at the two world wars as a whole, that only between 1916 and 1918, and possibly between 1944 and 1945, did Britain do anything other than that. It essentially put a limited military capability on the continent, except for those years. His second point was that Britain should use blockade. As he wrote, to quote him, by closing the enemy's commercial ports, we exercise the highest power of injuring him, which the command of the sea can give us. In July 1914, both France and Russia wanted Britain to make its position clear in the July crisis and to commit itself to a coordinated allied effort against Germany in order, of course, to deter it from entering the war. When France and Russia looked to Britain for that support, it did not do so because of its army. Memorably, the President of France, Raymond Poincaré, uh, said in July 1914 that he only needed one British soldier on the continent of Europe. Uh, and the vital role of that one British soldier was that he should be killed. Uh, because by being killed, he would then commit Britain to support the French. The rest of the British army didn't matter because all Britain could produce was 100,000 men, uh, and the remaining 999,999 could go on living, because actually, in relation to the mass armies raised by European powers, up to 3 million men in the case of Germany, France, and Russia, 100,000 was quite frankly neither here nor there. What France and Russia wanted from Britain, both in terms of its deterrent power in the July crisis, and its actual power, if war should come, was the Royal Navy. What it wanted was sea power. Um, in, on the 18th of April, 1913, the French uh, Superior Council of War, which was actually a, an army organization rather than a navy organization, had met. And they said, quite frankly, it doesn't matter if the British Army comes to France, one way or the other. Uh, it may have a moral effect, but it doesn't matter much. What matters? is British sea power. And of course, when the July crisis broke, it was the Anglo-French naval agreement to which the French ambassador in London, Paul Combon, referred when he put the pressure on the British. Because he said, you must commit yourselves because we're relying on you to defend the northern coast of France. The French Navy is concentrated on the Mediterranean. Um, we have left our coast exposed to the Germans if the Royal Navy isn't there. France believed that Britain's solidarity with France and Russia would have an effect uh, because of the deterrent effect of the Royal Navy. On the 30th of July 1914, the British ambassador in Paris, Lord Bertie, wrote to the British Foreign Secretary, Threadbrook Gray, that a British decision to support the French would almost certainly, these were his words, prevent war as Germany would not run the risk of having her seaborne trade destroyed and of being starved out by the British fleet. Indeed, he went on to say that the deputy uh, French chief of the general staff, de Castelnau, in other words, a soldier, not a sailor, believed that if the Royal Navy were committed to this war, that it would be won in four months. 